Income Tax 2022-2023, what's new? Let's do some wealth preservation with some tax preparation. Most of this information can be found on the Form 1040 Tax Year 2022 instructions at the IRS website, irs.gov, irs.gov. New stuff. The Form 1040 has a few new lines that we'll be looking at. Schedule 1 has some new lines as well. The filing status name changed from qualifying widow, widower, to qualifying surviving spouse. We now have got qualifying surviving spouse. So due date of return. File Form 1040 or 1040SR by April 18th, 2023. Once again, April 18th, 2023. The due date is April 18th instead of April 15th because of the Emancipation Day holiday. So if you're a tax preparer, you're almost surely going to be asked this question over and over. When are the tax returns due? When's the end day? You're going to say April 18th. They're going to say, why not April 15th? And you've got a nice little talking point there. You can say, well, it's the Emancipation holiday that we get in the District of Columbia. And for whatever reason, that means that we get an extra few days as well, even though they don't recognize my like my personal holidays or anything, but that's okay, whatever. So even if you don't live in the District of Columbia, that's the rationale. Filing status name changed to qualifying uh, su support accounting instruction by clicking the link below, giving you a free month membership to all of the content on our website, broken out by category, further broken out by course. Each course then organized in a logical, reasonable fashion, making it much more easy to find what you need than can be done on a YouTube page. We also include added resources such as Excel practice problems, PDF files, and more like QuickBooks backup files when applicable. So once again, click the link below for a free month membership to our website and all the content on it. Surviving spouse. So the filing status qualifying widow slash widower is what we used to basically call it. So you've got the single filers, you've got the married, you've got the head of household, and then you've got the more rare status. Hopefully it's a rare status for most of our clients. We don't see it happen, you know, all the time on a, on a year by year basis. But uh, the qualifying widow, uh, widower now is being called qualifying surviving spouse. So the rules for the filing status have not changed. It's just basically a name change. We got to change the name of everything these days. You know how it is. So the same rules that applied for qualifying widow, widow were applied to the qualifying surviving spouse. Just don't say the wrong name for stuff or, you know, bad stuff will happen. You'll get Twitter bombed or something. So see qualifying surviving spouse later. So we'll take a look at the filing statuses in more detail in uh, presentations in the future. Standard deduction amount is increased as has been expected, of course, because the standard deductions typically will go up uh, with inflation and inflation has been going up. So we would expect the standard deductions to rise with it. So for 2022, the standard deduction amount has been increased for all filers. The amounts are now the single or married filing separately, 12,950. We'll talk more about the filing, um, the, the standard deductions later, but the general idea is that these are gonna be the deductions that everyone would get. And then you can choose between having this deduction or the itemized deductions, only choosing the itemized deductions. If they're larger than the standard deductions, the standard deductions having been increased substantially a few years ago in an attempt to simplify the tax code, therefore most taxpayers are probably taking the standard deduction. The easiest way to kind of memorize the standard deduction is to basically think, well, I'm first just gonna try to memorize what the standard deduction is for a single filer. And then I'm gonna assume that if you're married, that we don't wanna dis or disincentivize marriage. So you would think it would basically be doubled the amount of the single filer because at, these, at this point in time, if you have two people that are married, then it's likely that you're not still in a one income household. Oftentimes you might have two people basically working. So you would think the standard deduction would be doubled. So you've got the 12,950 for single times two would be that 25, nine. So if you memorize the single filer, then you can kind of double it for married. And then the head of household is the weird one, which you would expect would be somewhere in the middle. Typically you need a qualifying dependent for the head of household status. Therefore you would expect it to be above the single. 
but below the married, single being the worst filing status with regards to uh, the tax taxes generally. So new lines uh, 1A through 1Z on form 1040 and 1040 SR. This year line 1 is expanded and there are new lines 1A through 1Z. That's exciting. So some amounts that in prior years were reported on form 1040 and form 1040 SR are now reported on schedule 1. You can see even as we've talked about our, our thought process in terms of learning the formula to memorize versus uh, the actual Form 1040 tax return, that if we were to construct the, the, this from scratch, the tax code from scratch, the forms from scratch at this point in time, it would be similar to us doing an Excel worksheet for most people, right? We would have the, the first 1040 actually be just basically a summary page, everything else being on schedules. And you can see they're kind of leaning towards doing that more and more so we've moved some stuff from the face first page of the form 1040 to schedules why didn't they do that before because the tax code used to be more simplified it used to be had to be done by hand you used to have to actually go get a physical paper tax form and it was then thought easier rightly so at the time to try to get everything on one page that was the point so then you can have different tax returns that are one are just on the same page or two pages or something like that that's no longer that important uh at this point because we file electronically and we can have a different tab on anything we want no no big problem so now it kind of makes more sense to try to say let's let's try to trim the taxes down to the 1040 just down to a formula and put more stuff on these related schedules so people with more complex tax returns can just have more complex schedules people that easy tax returns can use the same form 1040 but have less schedules would be the general idea that i think they're kind of going towards these days we'll see more of that we'll be able to conceptualize that when we make our excel worksheet and that'll be great so scholarship and fellowship grants that were not reported to you on form w2 are now reported on schedule one line 8r pension or annuity from a non-qualified deferred compensation plan or a non-government section 457 plan are now reported on schedule one line 8t wages earned while uh, incarcerated are now reported on schedule one line 8u so then we've got new line 6c on form 1040 and form 1040 sr so a checkbox was was added on line six taxpayers who elect to use the lump sum election method for their benefits will check this box you can see line 6c later if it's applicable to you non-taxable medicaid waiver payments on schedule one form uh 2020 for 2021 non-taxable amounts of medicaid this is medicaid non-taxable medicaid waiver payments schedule one so for 2021 non-taxable amounts of medicaid waiver payments reported on form 1040 line one were excluded from income on schedule one line 8z for 2022 non-taxable amounts will be excluded on schedule one line 8s so non-taxable combat pay election for 2021 individuals elected to include their non-taxable combat pay in their earned income when figuring the earned income credit that's the eic by reporting it on form 1040 or 1040 sr line 27. so for 2022 they will make this election by reporting non-taxable combat pay on form 1040 or 1040 sr line 1i we might dive into this one a little bit more when we get into like the uh, earned income tax credit calculation, which is a quite complex uh, calculation. And when you're talking about combat pay, oftentimes like military pay, people in the military have kind of like special rules, given the fact that they're serving, you know, in the military and whatnot. And you're trying to get a benefit from uh, being able to include income or not include income. So if you usually it's a benefit to not include income or have income that's not taxable because income is bad for taxes therefore if you can exclude it that would usually be good but with the earned income tax credits your income actually goes up uh for to some uh, degree with more earned income so you can actually harm somebody tax wise by telling them that you have a non-taxable income source when you th think about the earned income tax credit so 
sometimes they might give you the best of both worlds with like combat pay you might be able to you know have it not be taxable maybe or something like that but still be able to include it when you calculate the earned income tax credits we might dive into that in more detail like i say in future presentations so credits for sick and family leave for certain self-employed individuals are uh, not uh, available self-employed individuals can no longer claim these credits so that's going to be the credits for sick and family leave now notice uh, when you get into the self-employed kind of situation, what often happens there is that is that basically the, the government is taxing sole proprietorships on a Schedule C with regards to payroll taxes in a similar way as like an employee uh, would be paying basically payroll taxes because you have to pay self-employment tax, which includes the Social Security and Medicare employer and employee portion. So what often ends up happening, and we saw like a lot of examples of this during the whole COVID thing when they changed the tax code a lot, trying to incentivize people or employers to keep people on working, is that they made some adjustments to like employee benefits and things like payroll taxes and whatnot. And that kind of confuses things because then when you look at the self-employed individuals, it's like, well, hey, wait a second, you're treating self-employed individuals as in essence employees of themselves at least with regards to the the application of the payroll taxes which are the social security and medicare and the form of uh, of of um, of self-employment tax so so that means so that means that they often have to make a tweak to the law every time they do something with payroll taxes or employees for the sole proprietors and whatnot and so those things go back and forth and whatnot. So we might dive into that more with the Schedule C. Health coverage tax credit is not available. So the health coverage tax credit was not extended. The credit is not available after 2021. So that one had a, a, a date of termination and was not extended. So credit for child and dependent care expenses. Uh, the changes to the credit for the child and dependent care expenses implemented by the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021, the ARP, were not extended for 2022. The credit for the child dependent care uh, expenses is non-refundable. So again, a lot of the stuff that they were trying to do in response to COVID, at least it, it originally was in response to COVID, right? They had, they shut everyone down. They shut down businesses and whatnot and then they gave out the stimulus payments and, and that so you can argue whether the shutdown was a wise move and then but once they shut you down you can you could say okay yeah that would make sense that you'd need to pay people possibly do these weird things with the payroll taxes and the stimulus payments and all that kind of stuff after it became clear that reopening it seems to me would be the the wise move and then trying to trying to work through how you can you can mitigate the effects of COVID uh, after that point in time, after the hospitals aren't overwhelmed and all that kind of stuff, then it became fairly apparent that they were kind of seems to me my interpretation that they're holding on to the the idea of of an emergency so that they can score political points by making more and more uh, just giving just giving money out after that point in time. So you can see some of these other credits. They kind of extended maybe beyond the emergency uh, point. And, and so now at some point, we can't keep doing that because if they were to keep doing that, you would think we would overextend and either cause inflation or have a substantial increase in the debt, which is basically just pushing uh, the problem forward to the future generation. So they have to stop it at some point. And so now they're kind of rolling back on some of these laws. Now, some of the laws were basically saying that when you talk about the credits, they could increase some of these lower income credits uh, and then they can make more of it a refundable credit. A refundable credit means, and we'll talk more about this when we get to the credits, but it basically means that your tax liability can go beyond zero so that you're not only not paying taxes, but you're getting money, which you can they still call a refund, but it's not really a refund, it's a benefit program beyond the taxes. So at most credits, they don't do that because they say that the credit is supposed to lower the amount of tax you owe it shouldn't take your tax liability below zero unless we specifically put it in there as like a benefit or welfare program as opposed to like a, a standard tax credit kind of kind of thing 
So we'll talk again, we'll get more into that. There's been a lot of changes in the last few years with regards to those kind of credits and the refundability of them. And now they got to roll they got to they've got to roll it back at some point in time. So it's kind of an interesting timing that they had to basically roll it back at this point in time as well because obviously we've got elections coming up and stuff. So so it's interesting the way this is all kind of rolling out. So the dollar limit on qualifying expenses in th uh, is 3000 for one qualifying person and 6000 for two or more qualifying uh, persons. So the dollar limit for qualifying expenses is 3000 for one qualifying person and 6000 for two or more persons. We'll get into the more details of that when we get to the credits. So the maximum credit amount allowable is 35% of your in employment related expenses. Uh, so for more information, you can see instructions for form 2441 and publication 503. Child tax credit and additional child tax credit. Many changes to the child tax credit, the CTC implemented by ARP were not extended for 2022. So here's another area where they really overextended the child tax credit like a lot. And you can see that this was their, like after the stimulus payments, they wouldn't, they couldn't get the, the further stimulated, stimulus payments to go through, even though they were kind of, it seemed like they were kind of extending the COVID emergency to try to you know, spend money to look to me like they're doing a political thing, grandstanding, you know, just because it looks good to give people money, right? They couldn't do that anymore. So they basically then increased the, the child tax credit uh, was the next thing that, that, that happened. And the child tax credit is a credit we've always been familiar with before, but they did this, this thing, which was similar to the stimulus payments where they increased the credit and then they and then they took part of that credit and they basically wanted to give that out in an advanced payment which again that so they can give money out like sooner so it looked kind of like a stimulus payment but it was tied to the ctc again that couldn't really be sustained at that level of the credit so so now it's got it they couldn't really keep it going so it's going to have to at some point go back to to the, to something to what it was basically before so here the, and that's what they did so they so they couldn't extend it so the initial credit amount of the ctc child tax credit is two thousand for each qualifying child so the amount of the ctc uh, that can be claimed as a refundable credit is limited uh as to as it was in 2020 except the maximum additional child tax credit the actc amount has increased to 1500 for each qualifying child so part of what they did uh, it was they tried to increase the credit and then they and then they tried to make more of it refundable and then give more of it out uh, out out sooner in an advance payment. So now, of course, they're not doing the you know, they have to roll back the whole advance payment. They got to put the child tax credit back to basically what it was. And then we have this issue of the refundable portion of the credit, the credit that can take you below the tax liability below zero versus the non-refundable credit. We'll dive into that more, do some do some practice problems with it when we get to the credit section and, and see how that works. A child must be under age 17 at the end of 2022 to be a qualifying child. Bonafide residents of Puerto Rico are no longer required to have three or more qualifying children to be eligible to claim this, the ACTC. Bona fide residents of Puerto Rico may be eligible to claim the ACTC if they have one or more qualifying children. For more information, see the instructions for, for uh, Schedule 8812, Form 1040. So changes to the earned income uh, credit. So the uh, enhancements for taxpayers without a qualifying child that ap applied for 2022 one don't apply for 2022 this means to claim the eitc without a qualifying child in 2022 you must be at least age 25 but under age 65 at the end of 2022 so uh the earned income credit the earned income credit is another credit which is aimed at the lower income individuals and is a quite complex credit we'll talk more about it when we get to the credit section uh, and we'll dive into it in more detail, but obviously that's another area where you would think they would target if they're trying to basically increase the amount of money that they're they're giving out, right? So that same thing basically happened with it. They gave up the stimulus payments. They extended the the kind of emergency threshold so they can try to make changes then to the child tax credit. 
and the and the earned income tax credits and now they're basically kind of rolling back th those uh to some degree to where they to where they kind of were before uh that point in time the earned income tax credit is a complex one because it has income has to be earned and the credit actually goes up as as earned income goes up up to a certain threshold and then it goes back down economists like that generally because it's an attempt to give kind of a benefit to the people that need it without crushing them by forcing them not to be independent by by not being able to work because then if people go to work they lose the credit and that becomes a problem so you don't want to actually have the benefit program incentivizing people to not look or seek to be dependent you want to you know teach a person to fish would right would be the would be the idea so so that's what it's trying to do but in doing so it's quite complex because now you've got these different income thresholds and uh it also ties in the ch the number of children that someone has as well which could you know incentivize you would think from a tax standpoint people having children to get tax benefits which seems like a counterproductive kind of thing you know that doesn't seem like the rationale for having children to get you know tax benefits seems like a weird kind of incentive structure but that's the way it is right now so in any case if you are married and filing a joint return either you or your spouse must be at least age 25 but under age 65 at the end of 2022 so one of the issues with the earned income credit is they're kind of concerned with lower income individuals or i'm sorry lower aged individuals because they might still in essence be dependent on their parents at that point in time and and that's becoming kind of like more normal it takes longer for people possibly to become independent uh at this time so so they're trying not to so that might be some rationale for the age at 25. so it doesn't matter which spouse meets the age requirement as long as one of the spouses does so reporting requirements for four so then of course if you have married individuals then the question you got this age requirement but the ages could be different for the two people filing the one married filing joint return so reporting requirements for form 1099k form 1099k is issued by third-party settlement organizations and credit card companies to report payment transactions made to you for goods and services so note that if you're a sole proprietor if you're doing gig work or something like that if you have your own business and you work for like another business the business has to give you a 1099 because remember how the income taxes work they the tax irs has incentives to pressure the person that's paying in a business transaction to tell the tell them who they are paying because they want the deduction for the money that they paid uh, so that the irs can go after the person who received the money which is the person that has to report income so that means that uh, if you're working as a business as a sole proprietor for another business you're doing a job for a business then they're likely to give you a, a 1099 form that's how it generally works now with gig work it kind of messed up the irs's whole kind of oversight thing because now you've got these platforms and uh, these payment platforms such as a PayPal's and whatnot, and like these gig work platforms that you can go on the Ubers and that kind of thing. So that in essence, you have your own business and you're not, and you're not actually doing work for another business. You're just doing work for a customer, but you're being connected by the flat platform. It's kind of, I think of it as like a new Silk Road type of thing, connecting people that could trade and do business that were not connected before opening up new markets that that we did not have before but the government you could see why they wouldn't like these kind of industries as well because they're kind of like cash based industries they're like hair salons they're like restaurants they're like massage parlors and you know what the nails things the manicure places and whatnot because those individuals the irs is notoriously not really liked because they get paid not by a business but by the end user by a customer and you can't force someone who gets their haircut to rat out the person they paid to the IRS and give them a 1099. So the IRS doesn't know how much money these people earn, which is why I think they were the government went after them during COVID because they don't like them anyways. But I'm just that's just my conspiracy theory. But in any case, the gig work is the same way. So you can see what they're going to try to do is force the middle person, the, the Silk Road, 
they're going to put an ogre under the Silk Road to force a toll, like, right? That, that means that they're going to try to force the payment platforms uh, like the PayPal's and the credit card companies and whatnot, or force the Uber platforms or whatever the platform is that's making the connection to issue the 1099s, which will probably be uh, depressing or, or crushing the actual uh, growth of, of the industry. So the pie will be smaller, will produce less stuff, but the IRS will get their piece, right? more likely to get their share. You can see, you can see how it works there. So you must report all income on your tax return unless excluded by law, whether you receive the income electronically or not, and whether you receive a form 1099-K or not. So obviously if you don't get a 1099-K, then you still should report your income if you don't have a 1099 for it. But the IRS doesn't trust that that will happen uh, consistently. That's why they're trying, obviously they want to try to look over everyone's shoulder, which they have some justification for that. It's quite likely that people don't always report their income if they don't receive a 1099K. There's just the question of how should you address that? Should you address that with more audits that are random audits, kind of like traffic tickets on the, on the road? Or should you be a lot more intrusive and possibly destructive to the industry in and of itself by forcing these 1099 reportings in third party platforms and whatnot, or forcing people to work as a W-2 employee as opposed to a, their own business or that kind of thing. So that's the questions that we're dealing with these days. So the box 1A and other amounts reported on form 1099-K are additional pieces of information to help determine the correct amounts to report on your return. So if you receive form 1099-K, uh, that shows payments you didn't receive or is otherwise incorrect contact form 1099 issuer. So note that any form that you get that is incorrect, a 1099K or otherwise, miscellaneous, whatever, or a W-2, if it's not right, then you can't you can't really go to the IRS and say, say, hey, look, this, this form isn't right. I reported it correctly on my form 1040 because the IRS is, is gonna go by the by the form. Now if there's no other way to fix it, then you then you might have to do that. But what you want to do first is try to go to the issuer of the form 1099 and say, hey, look, you got to fix this because the IRS has it. And if I report something different, if I report the correct amount, which is not the amount you reported on the 1099K, the IRS is going to ding me for it and they're not going to give me the, you know, they're going to try to make an adjustment. So the first step, try to go back to the issuer of the 1099. If you can't do that, then you're going to have to deal with the IRS, then you're going to have to report it the way you're going to report it. And then you'll have to deal with the IRS, which is a much more burdensome process. So don't contact the IRS. The IRS cannot correct an incorrect form 1099K. If you can't get it corrected uh, or you, you sold a personal item at a loss, see the instructions for Schedule 1, Lines 8Z and uh, 24Z later more uh, for more reporting information. All IRS information about Form 1099-K is available by going to irs.gov forward slash 1099-K.